Hi, it's Colleen Schmidt from Divination Counseling Service, here to do something a little bit different. I've been really concentrating, and I'd love to hear even feedback on this, uh, to eliminate all of the um, entertainment out of my channel and to replace it with all educational lectures. And so I'm moving into uh, another subject. But with that said, I do want you to know that I will continue to be putting up diurnal charts, looking at probably gambling and other things. I actually have something, um, an example that I may do later this week of a diurnal chart and its success. I also want to continue to look at relationships because I don't think we can do a once and done on any of this material. But what I really want to talk about today is something entirely different. And I, I think I'll be peppering in these kinds of lectures throughout. So while we're looking at diurnals and we're looking at the, um, the uh, relationships, I'm going to also talk a little bit about the history. Okay, so before I begin, uh, this is going to be a straight on lecture, by the way, I really have no visuals for probably once in a very long time. But before I get to all that, I do want to say thank you to all of my subscribers, in particular, the new subscribers. Thank you so much, guys. But even the old subscribers, you guys have really been helping me build this channel. And I am very grateful. If you're not a subscriber, I hope you'll be consider becoming one. And in the meantime, if you would like, share, comment, in particular comment, I'd really love to hear from you. I also want to thank, I got a donation uh, from one of the last series. And I want to say thank you, really thank you for the donations because honestly, uh, I was under the impression that you could really didn't get those until you had a thousand people and you were doing uh, stuff where those thousand people could come and uh, actively listen to you while you're live. I'm quite away from that, but I, I want to thank you nonetheless, because donating to me right now is awesome, only the sense that it really proves that you have faith in me. So thank you so much, really, all of you guys, even the comments. It's just been so heartwarming. And it really has helped me be very decisive about what I'm going to be looking at as we move forward. So today, I want to talk about something that's very near and dear to my heart. And I want to explain to you a little bit of why it is such a strong interest to me now. <laughs> okay. In the 1990s, the United States finally developed an astrology school. I was, however, knee deep in my cosmobiology, my Uranian, and my asteroid studies, particularly medical asteroids, if I'm not mistaken. That's when I was really starting to get into them. And I really did want to go to school for astrology, and it was worked out that I would have had to only spend a couple weeks there with Seattle, Washington. I actually live on the East Coast, so that was quite the distance. And I was uh, a mom. Okay, my daughter was still fairly young at that point. She still needed me. So I really wanted to make this heavy decision about whether or not I should go to school. I had been studying astrology well, since I'm nine years old, I'm not even going to really tell you. Just Let's just say that it's a really long time. And at that point, even in the 90s, and both of my teachers really felt that I had, it was two teachers that I discussed this with, that I was really far along in what I was doing. And they also uh, let me know what the Kepler School would be specializing in, which was not at all what I was doing. I think that one of the things that you have to realize when you come into astrology is how very vast the subject matter is and that there are so many different areas where you could literally be an expert, but then not really know so much about the next area. And I was studying like ultra modern stuff. I was doing the dial. I was doing uh, Uranian cosmobiology. I was doing, uh, like I say, asteroid studies. And I was incorporating a lot of asteroids into my work at that time. And when I approached my teachers, 
both of whom were, one was teaching the Uranian. I was trying to learn the Uranian houses, which is really a complicated system, but really cool. And I was learning a lot of medical astrology. As a matter of fact, I was starting to dabble myself. The teachers advised me not to do it. And their advice was not that they had anything against what was being taught at Kepler, but everything against the fact that I had gotten so far with what I was doing that it would have been like starting completely over in a new subject era. And it really would have been. So here I am 20 years, 30 years later. My goodness, where does time go? 30 years later. And I decided that um, I really wanted to study, and I have had this thought for a while, Hellenistic astrology which is exactly what was taught at Kepler University. And you're saying, what is, Kep what is Kepler? Well, Kepler is the name of the school and Hellenistic is the name of the astrology. Now, initially I was under the impression, and I think that this is still part of Hellenistic astrology, that Hellenistic astrology was actually the study of the ages, okay? And that they have a very different uh, concept of astrology because they're not studying individuals, they're studying ages, okay? So they're studying whole historical periods in some cases, okay? And uh, really interesting subjects. Um, my daughter, we were watching, um, and I'm just going to talk about this for a second. I'm kind of Patrick a second. So I'm using, this is the book I'm reading right now. It's a thick one. All right. Um, certain chapters, I'm going to get on here and I'm going to go through them with you. And other chapters, I'm in one right now, probably not going to talk about very much at all. And there's a reason for that. We'll get to that. This Hellenistic astrology book was written by a young man. And I can say he's young because I'm significantly older, I'm sure. His name is Chris Brennan. And he is a student of Kepler. He's one of their uh, astrology students. It's done a heck of a job. And this gathering of Hellenistic astrologers um, has also put out an incredible series of videos called Changing of the Gods, which is really the study of Uranus and Pluto, which are, well, Pluto, slower moving than you can get, boy. Like, you know, the only thing we might want to look at is maybe some Neptune stuff because they also are slow. But looking at the age, because that's what it represents. We're talking about a 12 year, 11 to 12 year period of time. So it creates what's called a zeitgeist, which is a flavor, if you will, for the age. And this nine part, and I think there's going to be a 10th, you know, we're at the end of the ninth. I actually signed up so I would have access to all this extra information. One of which is, I think, interviews by other astrologers, including Chris Brennan. So in, in viewing this video, it was a reminder of what an incredible uh, subject matter Hellenistic astrology is. Okay. So. In Hellenistic astrology, when you're studying Zeitgeist and you're studying the ages, the degree of orb is obviously not one degree, like I often will try to put us in. But depending on whether it's square conjunction or uh, opposition, it could actually go out 15 degrees. So they're studying at least 10, but it could go up 15 degrees. So it's really exciting to look at this stuff. Uh, I loved this series, so I highly recommend it. Um, it is coming out of, like I say, there's a bunch of people from this whole Kepler University thing. But I want to stress something about Hellenistic astrology. Initially, you know, a lot of people will look at this and say, well, you know, this is the beginning of astrology. No, <laughs> no, it's not. It's the beginning of Western astrology, okay? One of the things that's been really hard for me to kind of explain to people, especially in this country. Now, if you're outside of this country, hopefully you do not run into these concepts. But there's so little known about astrology here in the United States. It's getting better, but there's really been a religious affront to astrology that has occurred, particularly during my lifetime. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But Hellenistic astrology is actually the beginning of uh, 
Western wheel astrology. Okay. You know, they have astrology and I'm not even on my notes yet, but they have astrology cubiforms in, I think, Babylonia the date back 490,000 years. And yeah, they can do carbon dating. Okay. So astrology is very, very, very old, very old indeed. And I can tell you from just a little bit of reading that I've done, there was probably four different kinds of at least astrology at the time of the birth of Christ. Okay. I mean, this is just blows your mind. And by the way, astrologers have asserted that I believe Christ's birthday and correct me if you hear differently, but I believe it was March 10th in the year 6 CE. Now, some people use AD. They're getting away from that because let me give you an example. After the death of Christ would have actually been the year 39. So if you're going with after death before or after Christ before Christ, either way, the time is off because Christ wasn't even born till the year six. So even if you're saying, well, if Christ was born, then it would be. Ap-. No, you're missing six years. And if you go with his death, you're missing 39 years. So um, we really need to look at that. And I think that. I like the before common error and common error timing, which is so used in the Hellenistic astrology. I really enjoy that. Okay. So I want to talk about a couple of things. First of all, Hellenistic astrology, which is the basis of Western astrology and round. Now understand that uh, Hellenistic astrology uh, could be coming out of Mesopotamia, but there was also influences from Egypt. Remember, there's a lot of astrology and ultimately all learned people speak Greek. So they call it Greek astrology or Roman Deco astrology. But the truth be told is, is whatever language the intellects were speaking at the time. And I'm going to give you an example using modern day. I do a lot of work internationally anymore, and I am always thrilled by and I live in a country where there's a lot of languages spoken and I'm always thrilled by the amount of people that speak English um it's really interesting I always feel a little guilty my daughter apparently feels guilty we only speak one language well I speak astrology because I study dance I speak a little Sanskrit for yogi I speak a little French I speak a little Italian because when you're going through any arts program performing arts, whether you're doing music and dance, dance, of course, being French, music, of course, being Italian. But if you take me outside of those things, I might have a good French accent, but honestly, I might understand it. I understand German because I live in Amish country, but I do not speak it. You do not want me speaking it. But what amazes me is how the rest of the world speaks English. And it reminds me of another time when the world spoke Greek. So just keep that in mind. The thing about the Hellenistic astrology, and I do want to point this out, is that they have a lot of references that date back to the 200 BCE eras and the 100 BEC eras, but realize that you were still only talking one or 200 years before Christ. And that the Magis themselves, which came out of China, were already uh, doing astrology for maybe a thousand years at the time when they sent those astrologers to the birth of Christ. Okay. So one of the best resources that we've always had for astrology and the reason why we don't have all the connecting points of astrology is because a lot of that stuff was stored in the Alexandria library in Egypt. And I think I don't need to tell anybody out there how many fires have occurred in the library in Alexandria, how many bombings, how many, you know, civil unrests have affected this. Unfortunately, when people are in civil unrest, they are not thinking about the losses, but believe me as an astrologer, I think about things like the losses. So, um, one of the things that I, I really wanted to look at, okay, was 
how astrology went from literally being centered around religion. I know, isn't that bizarro? Okay, I'm going to tell you something else, trivia here. A lot of this is in my notes. I'll go back over it. But Abraham, the father of the Jews, has a book. He has a book on astrology. He dealt with the lots, and he understand he understood how to do an ascendant for a birth chart. It's coming to my mind that you couldn't have been a religious leader, a political leader, a doctor, physician, a philosopher. You couldn't have been anything if you didn't study astrology that it was a prerequisite to an education at certain points in history. So it's really amazing to me how astrology went from being something that people passed on from father to son, that it was known among the upper classes, that it was prominent on any physician or religious leader, and I think when you look at that, you say, well, how did this happen? How is it that astrologers are going to meet Christ? And now people are asking me if astrology is a belief system, which I, I, I'm always appalled by that, actually. Uh, no, I don't think it's ever been a belief system, even when it centered around religion. It wasn't really a belief system. It's a science, mathematically configured science. So I, I said to myself, one of the things that I want to understand is how did astrology go from being this incredible subject matter that any learned person had to understand? How did this happen? Well, there's a few things that happened. That and it and take it back to you know, astrology was actually designed and cultivated and taught and passed on long before what they call the age of reason or the age of thinking or the modern thinking change. I think I don't, I think it's 1500 that that happened or around the 15th century. I'm not sure, but they I've heard it twice in one week and and the age of modern thinking and. That changed a lot of things. That's when astrology um, in their astrology becomes not uh, earth centered, but sun centered. Uh, we understand now that we are not the be all end all. And I, and that's even going to grow exponentially as we go through time that we are going to understand that the universe itself is a, a great mind or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A consciousness that everything has a consciousness. And this is just new stuff that's coming up. But, you know, in the age where they, what they call modern thought, this was like where a lot of things changed. Okay. So we, not after that is when I think astrology is now something that is feared rather than something that is, uh, adulate um it's adored it's it's you can't do anything without it right okay a couple of things have taken place first of all the original authors in their infinite wisdom did not use their names don't i mean i don't understand it they already screwed our credibility my credibility because they didn't use their own names they actually used the names of like Hermes and Escapulus. And these guys might have written really good information in their time periods. But now we're going way back in time. And if you're writing in the first century or the second century BCE, obviously you're not using your real name. So for some reason, it, they thought it gave them more credibility to not use their names. I don't know, you know, being anonymous is not always that good, unless you're a hacker. So maybe that's what it was for them. I don't know. The other thing that uh, really, I think, um, what happens is, is that because astrology, because of the names and the name changes, 
they also call it propaganda. Not that it's propaganda in the way you and I think about propaganda, but they used it as that because they wanted to use these famous names. So already it's labeled propaganda. Okay. Their argument is that there's diversity in the techniques and the philosophies bode well for gradual uh, traditions. In other words, um, they're incorporating other traditions with the astrology. There are two thoughts, by the way, gradual therapy, where it gradually comes into being, and then there's this uh, where somebody makes an aha moment. Um, there's a whole chapter on this in this book, but I really have to tell you that as a modern day astrologer, somebody who's not really a learned Hellenistic astrologer, although there's a lot of stuff in Hellenistic astrology that I want to review because I've spent so many years not utilizing the dignities, the, um, the decants, the, all of these things, because they're not so relevant when you start working with a dial. Okay, but they are relevant in overall astrology. And I've learned since going back to some of these dignities and exaltations and decans and all of this, that I'm actually getting more out of my readings, my own personal stuff. So it is worth it to look at. Um, the uh, gradual, of course, represents centuries of development. And they again go back to Mesopotamia and to uh, Egypt. Now, I do want to stop here for one second because Mesopotamia continues in its own philosophy. And you would say to me, well, how do you know that? Well, one of the things I'm going to be introducing to you all very soon is the traditional charts that were used in Mesopotamia. They're square. They are square. And I want to do a whole thing when I get there. I have so many plans. That's why I'm going to have to stop all entertainment stuff because I have so many plans. But I really want to look at rectifications. And this person who did the rectification, uh, another, another author who used, and he's modern day, another, he used Romulus or something. I mean, obviously that's not his name. But in his case, I will say maybe it was probably better for him to be incognito because he's doing a book of rectifications on the United States presidents and their wives. So, you know, that can always be a little controversial. So, OK, maybe. And we'll get to that. I'll look at that. It also gives me a lot more information for relationships. OK, so in Mesopotamia, they are using square charts. Now, it doesn't mean that the round charts, which use the decants, which uh, have now ascendants and, and midheavens and all of that, because they did figure out how to tell time. They did it with an astrolabe, so something that they did with water, and they were able to tell time early, early on, by the way. And they used it. Now, one of the things that was pointed out to me when I said how amazing it was that they were, they gathered all this information for thousands of years. We didn't have clocks. We didn't have computers, but what they did have was a clear sky, something we don't have. It means that every night they went outside, they could see everything. That's not true for us anymore. And I think that their sky watching is what really helped to establish, by the way, astronomers were also astrologers at one point. So all of that was really important. So getting back to my notes. So, it, um, so basically, um, one of the reasons that they also have issues with astrology and calling it propaganda is not just that the authors didn't really use their name, but it's that loss of information, gaping holes in the work. A couple of things here to note. They, there are copies of charts but not the interpretations. They can tell you what was in a chart. It might even be listed. There's some listed in the book, but unfortunately there's no interpretation listed. And it could be a number of reasons. A lot of this work was produced and done orally, which was, it, it's part of an oral tradition. So there wasn't as much written down or passed on. 
They did have resource books. We already know that Abram, as it's written in the book, but it's Abraham, had his book. Okay, they all had books um, and they all contributed to the growing technique of astrology. Okay, um, so that was the whole first part of what I was doing. And it does, it, it really does talk about how, um, you, as I said, I can only tell you that from my own personal experience, I believe that there's both been gradual and sudden adjustments made in astrology. And why do I know that? Well, because I'm an astrologer and because some of my growth has been gradual and over the last 45 years, oh my goodness, 50 years, it's been a long time, 55 years, it's a long time, okay? And over those years, I learned a little and then, you know, light bulbs would go off and then maybe I'd step away and then I'd come back and again, you know, gradually fill myself up with this stuff. And so I know as an astrologer, that's how I learned. So, and again, this is the United States. Kepler is our only school. You live in Germany, you would go to the Hamburg school. I think almost every other country has schools for astrology except for this one. But in this country, we, well, I shouldn't say only this country because I think Ireland has had a real issue with religion as well as so does the South American country. So I think that when religion comes into play, it really downs, it makes astrology kind of go under wraps. I'm hoping that futuristically that's not true any longer. I think that as we emerge more into this Aquarian age that we're now sitting in, that will not be true. I think you have to accept the fact that in the Piscean age, they weren't going to have anything to do with anything that was self-empowerment because the whole empowerment concept is supposed to come through religion, I guess, you know? So, okay. So as I move on with my, um, my notes, I can tell you that it is grabbing from this and grabbing from that. And a lot of the work that we're doing could be coming right out of Egypt because Egypt gives us the decons the decants. Okay. And what is a decant in astrology? Well, eventually I'm going to explain all of this to you, but a decant is, okay, if you're a uh, Taurus and you were uh, born at the end of um, April, you, and say in the first 10 degrees, you would have fallen in what's known as the first decant. If you were born sometimes after the first of May, it changes, it becomes the second decant. So right around there, it could be off day or two and every year's a little bit different. So anything from say 10 degrees to 20 degrees of Taurus falls in the second decant of Taurus. And this is for every sign. Every sign has 30 degrees, so every sign has three decants, okay? And each decant means something, but I'll tell you where it really means something and where it's very much worth studying is in Hellenistic astrology where we, uh, as a world, just spent uh, 240 years, I believe it is 240, 250 years, uh, almost as old as this country is actually, in what's called the Capricorn decant of Pisces, which means the religious thing, but money, 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 materialism. I think we can honestly say that we can see that. <laughs> we can see that no matter what country you live in. And I think that um, the religious right, particularly in this country, um, unfortunately has really done some bad things during the last few years with the last president. Okay, but that's okay because the reign of that is coming to an end as we approach the first decant of the Aquarian age. Okay. So, um, okay. So then, um, and I could be, I could be wrong on a lot of this guy. So please, please correct me if I am. Um, this is just stuff that I've gathered through the years. I'm not a Hellenistic astrology. Don't study the ages. Well, I do, but I wouldn't call myself an expert at it. I would call myself an expert at doing natal work and doing relationships, particularly diurnals. In that arena, I am somewhat more of an expert, asteroids in particular, but 
when you get to stuff like this, I'm going to say things that maybe are confused or mixed up. So I do want to throw that out there. Okay, so all um, everything helped to develop Hellenistic astrology, and this infusion is already in play 200 years before Christ is even born. So 200 years before we get to what's called the common era. Okay, there are texts in Mesopotamia on mundane astrology, which is everyday astrology. Hellenistic astrology deals a lot with mundane astrology. That's age astrology. That's looking at what is going on in the world around you. Mundane astrology would be like an event's coming up and you want to just look at what's going on that day. Okay, that's that's mundane astrology. There are three kinds of astrology, though, that have been developed through this. Natal astrology, mundane astrology, integral astrology, which is where electional astrology comes out of. And that's where you choose the chart because it was a good time. Okay? I did do that when I got married, which was a really long time ago. <laughs> okay? So electional astrology. All right? Um, so they've been translated, these texts, and they've been adapted. Okay, and they've been around Egypt since 500 years before the common era. See what I mean about astrology? I, I just, it is older than Christianity. And that's one of the things that really irks me about religious people who poo poo what I do. I've, I've gone through a lot in my lifetime. I think it's gotten better or either that or I've just gotten better at defending myself. But all the while I'm growing up, it's getting poo-pooed by Christians. And I got to be honest with you, it's thousands of years older than Christianity. It marked the time of Christianity. It was the factor that pointed out that night star that Christ was born under. So very important. Okay. So 500 years BCE before common era. So that is so awesome. I mean, if we're in the year 2022, we're going back 2,500 years and better, maybe 2,600 years. Okay. Like I said, astrology has really been around an incredibly long time. It is the way that Tiberius of the Roman Empire, he had an astrologer. Uh, the son of that astrologer went on to be an astrologer for another because Tiberius ended up being Augustus or Augusta. And then, so in other words, here's even Rome. Okay. And, you know, this whole thing, before there was Christianity, there was astrology advisors. It's so bizarre. Okay, so by 200 BCE, we have natal astrology being taught in schools. And they are called, let's hope I don't do this wrong, Barosis, Barosius. Barosius, Barosius, Barosius. It's, it's during a Hellenistic era in Babylonia, and um, they write about it in about the third century. There are some insights to what um, astrology looked like in the first century Egypt. Um, and it had its beginnings of a house system already at this point and the beginnings of the angles of the chart. That's something you and I talk about every single time we get together and I throw an astrology chart up there. The first thing I talk about, the angles of the chart, the ascendant, the descendant, the midheaven, and the IC are the angles of a chart. It's awesome. By the early second century, they now have ascendants. They already knew how to calculate the rising sign. They have what's called the hour maker. See, they, they don't need clocks and computers. They have the sky. They could have used the angles of the chart long before they say they use 12 houses because the 12 houses are derived from the angles, which is um, really interesting. And, you know, when I talk about the secrecy of astrology, you had to be initiated, by the way, to become an astrologer. 
In 1888, yes, many years after the fact, the Golden Dawn reemerges. The Golden Dawn is a secret society. That's what do they call thespians. They're 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 spiritualists, and they um and there there's people that uh, are um, educating educating. So they're learning astrology again. They're learning about the tree of life and the sephiro. Um, that is in the tree of life, which is now we're going way back to the mysticism of the uh, Jews. And so you're, they all have their like beginnings, right? Well, everything's secret. And even in 1888, when you go back to the golden dawn, it's all secret. And I always think that's stupid because this is one of the most empowering tools that we've been given. And by the way, for all those people that think it's against the Bible, check out 2 Corinthians in the Old Testament. It is in there as clear as day, and it tells you that your destiny can be read in the skies. There's a saying that we have outside of Christianity, which is, as above, so below. And what it means is that whatever's going on in the skies will be reflected here on earth in the microcosmos. Okay. All right. Then we go, <clears throat> you get a lot of writings that are still remaining from the second and the first centuries. They're, they're bits and pieces. Uh, some are on that papyrus. Some are stone. Some are, I mean, again, we didn't have paper. The way they did charts was to put a bunch of dirt on a, on a surface and draw it from there. Well, there's no way that there could be a permanent record. So the only thing we have are the, the text or the stones, okay? Um, so, uh, so by the time we get to um, the uh, second century, we find the first surviving Greek source that divides the circle, the wheel, into 360 degrees. But again, was it a Greek? We don't know because everybody spoke Greek. We just know it was written in Greek. Um, they, they used the, decon, the decans. They also started calculating rising signs for birth charts. Uh, they started using fixed stars, which is a whole other area of astrology, one I haven't even touched yet, um, probably because I'm the weakest of all of that. I'm actually stronger in Hellenistic. And even in reading traditional charts, which are square than I am when we get to the fixed stars, they're pretty, pretty interesting though. I have, you know, when you're an astrologer, at least you dabble. I've taken courses with people, just maybe a lecture or two. Okay. Cause it is interesting. So the fixed stars, which comes out of a document that's written by this anonymous of 379. So I'm thinking 379, uh, common error. Okay probably studied at or with the Barosis school or people that were like Barosis himself, if I'm even saying that name correctly, B-E-R-O-S-S-U-S, -S -S -S, okay? He said to, ha um, to have been, so in other words, he, it's been studied by the Egyptians. So here we go again with, we don't know who his teacher was. We do assume that the per person anonymous actually studied with Barosis but see, he's also the beginning of the third century, and this is the, the end of the third or 379, so I'm not quite sure. And nobody is. You read this, okay? And that brings me to why I'm not going to go through chapter four at all, which is all the astrologers they have documented. And they're like the first century and the second century. But here we go again with, they don't know too much about them. They just know their names because they're written, but is that their real names or is that a name they just thought that would make them look good? We don't know. And I can't say them anyway, cause they're all Greek. And so, you know, unless it's something that I work with in astrology now, and we do work with some of these, like I do work with asteroids called Hermes. I do work with, um, Prometheus. I do work with Escapulus. I do. So some of them I can say, but uh, you know, as an astrologer, that's my weakest area is that I can read it. I can know what it is. But the minute I go to say it, you can tell, boom, I don't know how to say anything. Okay. So, um, we don't know who put any of the interpretations on anything. Isn't that weird? Okay. Um, 
the first astrologers um, were based in the stars and then what they call the wandering stars. So a uh, much of astrology was probably based in the fixed stars before it was what they call the planets because they're also known as the wandering stars. You know, one of the things that, um, that uh, because everything changed and because they changed their names and they used old philosopher names like Plato. And, I mean, Plato, he studied astrology, but he was a philosopher. Um, but they did it to give themselves credibility. But now that we look back in history, then it doesn't really do well for their credibility. It doesn't bode well when it comes to studying astrology or promoting it. Okay. Because there's issues with authorship. Um, but you would have had to be initiated. I did talk about the golden dawn. I want to get through a lot of this because I see how much time has passed. Um, you know, what's interesting is that all of this was secret information. And even when it came back in 1888, nobody wanted to make any of this available for public con um, consumption, which could be another reason why the churches. Uh, especially the Christianity kind of really turned it off. They just really, it wasn't something that was open to the general public. It's only now and with the Aquarian age and the birth of the Aquarian age, all I can say is now is the time. So, so the Roman empire under Octavia later called Augustus. Okay. Was the high point for Hellenistic astrology with surviving horoscopes from the second and third centuries of the common era. This is when we gain the most information because now they're helping, uh, they can keep records better and they're helping these leaders. So there can be documentations. There are even charts that have survived. Um, the study of nativities, uh, natal astrology in, in particular as we're dealing with leaders. Um, so it's all a part of the Mesopotamian and Egypt Okay, realize that when you start, the Arab countries were involved in this in the very beginning, but understand that the Arab countries have their own astrology, Joyish, Vedic, under many names. It's very interesting. I know a lot of astrologers that do it. I don't. That would be too confusing. But I do know that I've done interpretation things where they were describing a chart, and then I looked at my chart and described it, even though my chart did not look like their chart, our interpretations matched fully. Okay, so just to let you know, they were involved in it, but that it kind of, this is more Mesopotamian, this is more Egyptian, okay? Um, and then Roman, Germ uh, Greek and Roman, okay, Greco-Roman. The subject of rectification is also um, really interesting um, because it's something that, you know, I think they were better at it than we are. And I think it's something that, again, we're just stirring that pot up. One of my teachers who unfortunately recently passed away, Heike Pot was the best rectifier ever. I mean, she really had a system. And now I'm going to be reading a book, which I'll share with you, of somebody who did it for the presidents and their wives. And maybe I can help a little bit there. Um, so... Right now, um, there's a couple of things like we have what's called universally uh, universal astrology, which is concerning the whole. Hellenistic astrology concerns the whole. Modern astrology calls this mundane. So when it's universal astrology, it's really mundane astrology. And it originated in Mesopotamia. Those astrologers that worked for politics did this based in natal charts particularly the political figures, not as much mundane. You might have thought mundane because there was, a, in the very, very beginning, there's this fear of things like eclipses. And so there was a lot of that. But by the third to the ninth century, it that kind of fades out. They kind of get more involved in natal astrology and what's also referred to as inceptional astrology. That's like the time when something happens and you take that time and it's the beginning or the commencement of something. Um, uh, and also I pointed out electional astrology. These all came about somewhere between the third and the ninth um, CE, which is common air. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, they also did, um, I, 
they did charts, they had a name for this too, uh, that were used as diagnostic tools. Now, it's really funny is I actually am involved in medical astrology. I've actually done case studies. I've actually worked with people uh, professionally as a medical astrologer. And I still always go back to that teacher still around and I still go back to her to, um, you know, pick her brain. But they were actually first used back in like the third, here we go again. Because if somebody got sick on the day that you got sick, they were going to be able to tell you from that event how long it would take you to get well, if you'd be able to get well, what might be required. So they were used now as a diagnostic tool, which is unbelievable. Okay. Which is, you know, which is, I thought was one of the most interesting things. 17th century horary astrology. Uh, started in the Rena Renaissance time, and it comes from a medieval time. And this is where they actually used astrology to answer questions on interrogations. Wow, think about that for a minute, okay? Inception charts were set up for times when astrologers met with clients. Well, they still do that today, by the way. I don't. Um, I, I always think I'm should, but I, I just, it doesn't always work out. Um, and there's uh, moments of importance, moments when an event will achieve what it occurs. These are things that are all have been done since the second and third centuries. The moment when a person is involved in the event or when they learn of the occurrence. The moment when a person becomes um, and asks the astrologer about the event. All of these times are significant. Now you understand why when you get into political stuff, it gets so bad because they got this happened here, but then that happened there. And all of those times kind of are in effect. It said eventually um, astrologers had to be very mathematical because um, originally they used boards with stones to depict the chart. Um, and the first charts actually date back to first century BCE. So a hundred years before the common era, eventually astrologers did have to be mathematicians. Okay. Which they were. Okay. I'm good in math. I, I think, I don't think I know any astrologers right now that are not somewhat better in math. So medieval charts are the square ones and the Hellenistic charts are the, are the round ones. Just so that you know that because Hellenistic charts never were square. Okay. They were used to also study synastry and relationships. The Hellenistic astrologers were. And here again, it, it could be that, um, you know, uh, they, they used, uh, they calculated the ascendance, the symbols and the glyphs, however, were not fully established until the middle ages. So that would be like what 15th century. So they didn't come around. They actually either wrote it out. Sometimes they used the first letter, um, for them. Medieval, the medieval glyphs, however, and there are some, but we don't really use those. But the ones that are similar would be, um, uh, I have it written down somewhere. I believe it's, the sun had a point on it. Now sun has a dot in it. And um, I believe there was one other, it might be Mercury. And I'm, uh, hopefully I do run into it here. Okay, so in 1543, the works of astrology acknowledge heliocentric astrology. This is around the time of modern thinking, the 1500s or the 16th century. Um, the sun moves around. Uh, we move, the earth itself moves around the sun. They didn't figure that out until then. Earth no longer is the center of the cosmos. This is the beginning of what we call modern thinking. Okay. Uh, fixed stars, we think, could date back maybe even 3,000 years. Okay. Um, but you got to understand something. Even in 100 years before Christ was born, astrologers were very thick into politics. Okay. And I believe that I've covered everything. I whipped right through it, but I, I, I hope that was interesting. Um, if you'd like to comment on that, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I do want to use this book to later get into dignities, the decants. I, I am going to show examples of square charts. Um, Janice, anybody who is Janice program, if you look under traditional, under the wheel section, go to traditional and it will pull that chart up as a square, but do bear in mind that the squares don't look at planets beyond Saturn 
and um, all your your cadent houses or your angles are like right up against the original square and then your other squares are on the outside of that. So creates a big square. With that said, thank you so much for watching this video and until we meet again, I leave you as I always do, that I wish you only happy reading.